Okay, so I'm Carrie Palsy. Um, I'm in the IoT team, and I'm going to be talking to you today about our la latest smart cities research. I'm going to be taking you through um, exactly what is a smart city, because everybody has a different definition. I'll be talking through the drivers and the barriers, um, and then uh, identifying the market opportunity and telling you, particularly as uh, communication service providers or other suppliers in, in, in the ecosystem, how you can make money from it because it's not an easy opportunity. Then, given the theme today, we're going to talk a little bit about AI and what's happening in the smart city and using AI today. And then we'll be finishing off with some recommendations. So as we go through the presentation, I'd like you to think about these five key messages. Um, there definitely is an opportunity in smart cities, and it's really growing at a pace, as you'll see in the slides. And the encouraging thing is, is that we're in a position where many cities are now demanding to have a smart city strategy. There's no longer um, a, a problem going in and talking about a smart city strategy, and, and, and that's a real change in the last two years that we've seen. The technology developments have definitely supported the business case. The fact that we have LP1 and modules are reducing in price is um, identifying and enabling brand new IoT use cases. However, as a supplier, when you go out there and talk to the cities, please do not lead your discussions on technology. Cities do not want to talk about technology. What they want you to do is to help them identify what their objectives are and then find the right solution for it. There are significant barriers to success, as I've mentioned, and not everyone will succeed. This is a highly fragmented market. You're coming up against competition for, uh, uh, against players in adjacent industries that you've never come up against before. And as I mentioned before, it's not an easy sale. So we do have AI already being used in the smart city, and we see that as being even more important in the future. And then for success, we really think that you suppliers out there need to be creative about your business models. The connectivity element is a very small part of smart cities, and you need to work with the cities to both be creative around your business models, but also their business models as well. So what is a smart city and what are the drivers? So within Open, we have identified seven key applications for the smart city. Um, they're on there, you can see them, um, and we'll be talking through some of those a little bit later. So on the demand side, there's lots of demands coming from cities to make them ready um, for, um, uh, to, for, to, for their smart city strategy. I'd like to highlight two of them. So the economic drivers are very much forefront for cities. They are looking to reduce costs. They've got ever-decreasing budgets. And as well, the flip side of that, they're also thinking about possible increase in revenues. That might come from regeneration, from tourism, um, and also possibly about the monetization of the data itself. They're also looking to provide citizen-centric services. And what that actually means is they want to engage the citizens, they want to improve their quality of life, but more importantly, they want to be able to have those measurable KPIs to demonstrate that they're improving that quality of life. And that's what a smart city does for you. And obviously, they want to improve the customer experience. So on the demand side, what are we seeing that's driving demand? So definitely the declining cost, that's probably the number one uh, driver from the supply side. The fact that we are unable to uh, enable so many more IoT use cases. So probably two years ago, there was probably 15 or 20 smart city use cases. Now we're talking more than 50, maybe even 100. It's phenomenal, the, the use cases that are growing. The technology developments as well are very, very important in smart cities. So LP1, low power wide area network. So licensed, unlicensed uh, technologies um, like Sigfox and LoRa for the unlicensed and MBIoT and LTEM for licensed. And the dramatic impact that they're having on the battery life is what's changing uh, the opportunity for smart cities. So you can now get a device and take it out and put it out in the field or, or put it down in a basement where you couldn't get cellular coverage before. And you can just put it there and leave it there for anything up to five to ten years. This was not possible on traditional cellular. So looking a little more at low power wide area networks and the fact that they are enabling these new um, use cases. So the box there, as you can see, we've got um, some of the module prices and the fact that the, how they've dramatically fallen in uh, recent times. So you've got Sigfo Sigfox there, you know, around one to two dollars, uh, going all the way up to LTEM, um, around seven to ten dollars. 
But I want to talk a little bit about the use cases and their enabling. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go through the, all of these that are on here, but I wanted to talk about one. So the poor gentleman there in the uh, top right-hand corner who's down in a sewer in India. So his job is uh, generally to go down there and try and unblock them. Um, what normally happens is that the floods come or, or there's rain and they get uh, flooded and this makes up um, around 60 to 7 percent of citizens complaints in a, in a, um, in a city called Jamshapur in India and what they've done is they have put sensors, so we're talking about five dollar Laura Wan sensors down in the sewers and what it does is it monitors the sewer levels and uh, using that together with the uh, information they're collecting from the weather sensors and also the predicted rainfalls, they can do some analysis around uh, predictive maintenance of those sewers and stop those sewers from flooding before they do. And that is making a dramatic impact on those citizens' lives. I mean, phenomenal impact. And you're talking about a $5 module here. So it sounds great. We've got loads of drivers on the supply side. We've got loads of drivers on the uh, demand side. So, you know, let's all go and make some money out of it. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as that. You know, the slide here talks about the multiple barriers. So the fact that you are largely dealing with public sector means that the procurement cycles are phenomenally long. Um, and also you have to deal with the politics of dealing with those customers as well. So often they're elected bodies, they're there for a certain period of time, they are making policies, you may be going in to negotiate towards the end of an elected period, suddenly all, all the terms and all bets are off and the policies have changed. So the bureaucracy of that is very, very difficult. The other big issue is the silos. So it was interesting, Chema was talking about the silos in Telefonica this morning. Well, the government, you know, government bodies that you have to deal with are exactly like that. So you'll find that you have to go to highways, you have to go to other departments, and trying to find those pots of money can be both time consuming and difficult. And what it actually means is that most deployments happen in a patchwork effect. So one department will roll out one particular smart city solution, and then another one will do, and they're not actually talking to each other and they're using a completely different set of vendors. The other issues are around the long-term viability beyond the pilots, the privacy and safety concerns of those, uh, those uh, citizens themselves and that fragmentation that I talked about earlier. So what do I even think is the market opportunity for smart cities? So these forecasts are very, very new. In fact, you guys are the first people to see them. I think we finished them uh, last week, so they are very, very new. And um, what, we, what we forecast is that there's going to be 600 million IoT connected devices in the smart city by 2022. Now, that's quite a significant growth rate if you look. You've got a KGAR there of 27%, and you've got an absolute growth of 157%. This is fast moving. What's interesting is the significance of China. So we estimate around 60% of these connections will be in China. Here are two graphs that come from two data trackers that we do within OVUM. The first is our um, IoT service provider contract tracker. What that does is it tracks publicly available um, con IoT contracts announced by service providers, and then we tag them into OVUM's nine verticals. As you can see, the smart cities one has really taken off from 2015, and the, the CSPs are winning lots of contracts in the smart cities. And then on the other side, um, we have the Smart Cities um, IoT project tracker. And in this, we log all um, Smart City contracts that we see and announcements. And then next to that, we uh, put in which are the service applications that have been deployed. And as you can see, Smart Lighting is the most deployed um, application. That's generally given because it's got a very clear return on investment once you move to LED, um, the energy savings there. And then it's a relatively small additional cost to add a sensor in there. Smart parking as well has a, a clear business case behind it, generally because the people parking are generating the revenues. So, how can the service providers make money from smart cities? So, here we have the value chain for smart cities. Um, it's quite recognisable value chain. We start with a device, we go all the way through the connectivity, the applications, professional services, and up to reporting and analytics. 
Now the point to make here for the service providers is your core business of connectivity over estimates is somewhere between 5 and 10% of that total value chain value. It's a very small amount. If you are going to make money from smart cities, you either need to partner in order to be able to offer an end-to-end -end solution and be in a prime aggregator role, or you need to be other part, uh, offering other parts of this uh, value chain. Connectivity alone is not going to make you enough money. I'm going to move on to a case study now of, uh, of Deutsche Telekom's Park and Joy. And the reason why I want to highlight this is uh, for several reasons. First of all, it's their replicability and scalability of this proposition. So they've rolled it out in 28 cities very, very quickly. And that's how you're going to make money. Find something that you can repeat very, very quickly. The other interesting point about this uh, solution is where the revenues are coming from. 10% of the revenues are coming from the city and 90% are coming from the end user themselves. And what this means is that's attractive to the city because you're not asking them to sign a massive contract. You're not asking them to do a massive outlay of capex. You go in and put the sensors in and then you're sharing that revenue. And they have a two-tier approach. So they have a pay-as-you-go, which is the basic one, and you pay a, a cost to, to park and to pay your uh, parking uh, through the app. Um, or they do a monthly subscription, which is uh, just under two euros. And for that, you are able to um, establish where there's an empty parking space. Um, you can then navigate to that parking space. It will use um, uh, location-based services. Um, you can also pay for your parking on the app. And then if you go shopping and you find that you've uh, finished early and you've paid for three hours but you only needed two, you can ask for a refund and it will allow you to do that as well. So it's giving the end user massive amounts of flexibility. The second case study I'd like to highlight around what CSPs are doing well in smart cities is Orange. Orange is having massive success in the Middle East, and they're tapping into vast amounts of money, of funding. So if you look at, Yamba, uh, the, sorry, if you look at the King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia, there's a $70 billion investment going in there to build four smart cities. We're talking about large, large, large amounts of money. They're also involved in the uh, Jeddah Economic City, and just to be involved in the uh, tower build itself, the tower is going to cost $20 billion. And they're going in, putting in all the ICT infrastructure, and then they're going to be involved in rolling out the smart city applications across the city there afterwards as well. So find those big pots of money. They're out there. So what can AI bring to the smart city? Data lakes. So data lakes is a term that's been around for a while, but what we're finding and seeing is that it's coming more and more used within the smart city environment. And the reason for that is those silos that I talked about earlier, those point-to-point -point bits of data that are, the, the, the city is collecting and not necessarily harvesting centrally. So what a data lake allows you to do is to take all those bits of data in and then uh, run some uh, AI and, and deep learning on it, and then have some actionable points and information and data come out of that. So we've seen lots of vendors talk and offer data lake solutions for quite some time, um, and particularly the cloud players. But what's interesting is we're now starting to see the CSPs offering productized data lake solutions for smart cities. And you have three logos up there of, of Deutsche Telekom and Telefonica and Verizon. All of these have a smart cities data lake solution available to buy today. And we think that's something that's going to uh, continue and grow in the future. So AI in the smart city, quite futuristic, talking about driverless cars, all these sort of interesting things that are you know, five, ten years away. Actually, it's not. So here we have some examples of how AI is actually being used in the city today. Um, so the Vodafone solution they are, uh, is their digital surveillance solution. They can take any CCTV camera system, doesn't need to be upgraded, connect it, and then the, the video is then taken 
off into the cloud. They run AI on it, and it allows the customer to be able to find any particular item or persons of interest. So say, for instance, you have a missing person. You know that they had a red backpack. You would be able to um, uh, scan all of those CCT cameras and, and, and find that person very quickly. And that has a dramatic impact on you know, all that scanning of CCTV video, which takes so long. We obviously have data, uh, digital, facial, digital facial recognition as well. But I wanted to talk a little bit about predictive policing. So Predpol are a company that has been doing it for a long time. Um, Santa Cruz there in California actually began their first trial of predictive policing back in 2011. So we're talking seven years they've been doing this for. And what it does is it takes all the data around crime committed. So where was the crime? Who was the perpetrator? The age, the neighbourhood. And then it runs AI on it and allows them to uh, gain uh, information onto where they think crime is going to occur and then deploy those resources, which frankly are reducing all the time, um, you know, more efficiently. And we also have that here in the UK. So Kent Police use it um, in Maidstone as well. And they also use it up in, in Manchester. And that's a growing trend that we're seeing and an opportunity that we're seeing for AI in the smart city. Traffic management. Um, the picture there, as you can see, has a, a driverless car that stops at traffic lights that change and um, as a pedestrian walks by. And that seems very futuristic as well. Actually, this company, Mio Vision, they have solutions available today that cities can buy that uses traffic management and AI together. And then the last point, autonomous cars. Yes, that is futuristic, and I appreciate that is. However, what's interesting is... Volkswagen mentioned, um, I think it was only two weeks ago, that they, are, they believe that they will have their, um, their uh, mini, minivan for public transportation uh, commercially available in 2021. You know, it's not far off. We're talking about sort of two, two and a half years away. So we're moving on to the end now, and I'm going to talk you through some recommendations that we have. These recommendations are largely for the service provider market. However, there are some that are applicable to their vendor partners as well. So seven recommendations for success in smart cities. First of all, you really must create a dedicated vertical. We see lots of CSPs and other players in, in the value chain trying to tack on smart cities as well. It doesn't work. You need to invest in it internally in a, and organisationally. You need to have dedicated specialists that understand how to go in and sell to this, this type of customer. You need to have product development that totally supports smart cities. It cannot be tacked on to an, an additional vertical. We also think that you need to invest in projects, uh, in acquisitions, and also in project funding and also living labs. The R&D and the uh, expertise and the harvesting of potential new applications is massive through these living labs. Don't underestimate it. We think it requires a strong brand with inroads into public sector. Basically, when we looked at the CSPs, all those that were succeeding were really sort of the former incumbents that had a strong ICT side, that perhaps had some systems integration experience as well, and fundamentally have also previously sold into the public sector. If you are a small tier three mobile only player, I would say smart cities is not for you. When you're designing your propositions, make sure it's modular. Most of the funding, as I said, works on a, 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 fragment, a, sorry, a, a project by project basis. Therefore, what happens with most cities is, is that one department decides they're going to roll out, for instance, smart lighting, and other department sees how well that's gone, and then are interested in perhaps smart parking or waste management. If you don't have a modular solution, then you're not going to succeed. Also, it needs to be easy to understand. This is complex, and often you're dealing with people that aren't necessarily from a technology background, which kind of goes back to my original point about not going in and selling technology. For the CSPs and, and for the vendors as well, you really have to be in that prime aggregator role. If you are not fulfilling all the parts of the value chain, that's fine. But what you need to do is to have those best of breed partners, but you need to be the main point of contact. Because if you're just selling connectivity, you're not going to make the money. Again, in order to fulfill that end-to-end -end solution that we talked about in the value chain, you must have those best-of-breed partners. And last of all, going back to that Deutsche Telekom example, scalability and replicability are the key to your financial success. Thank you.